expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. Hello, I'm Nathan Reynolds. Welcome to another Fathom Ministries podcast. We recently began a series on the book of Genesis. And as you know, when you read the very first verse of the Bible, we are immediately challenged with the glaring difference between what the Bible says about the universe and what science postulates and wants us to believe. This is our third lesson where we are using John Lennox's book, seven days that divide the world to enhance our own understanding of how the Bible and science agree and disagree. John Lennox is a professor emeritus from the University of Oxford, a Christian who is also a scientist, and someone who has contributed greatly to the Christian versus atheist debate in our time. For reference, see my previous podcast where we took clips from the Dawkins-Lennox debate and uh, parse them. We're going to join our live Bible study right now. I want to do a review of uh, where we've been. In chapter one, a few weeks ago, we were able to figure out that we understand that the Bible, the Bible best by reading it like we would any other literature of the same type. So if something is historic history, and we got history in the Bible, then we read it as history. And we don't change the type of literature in the Bible. So you get to Psalms, that's not history, that's Psalms and so forth. Um, We can learn from Christian history and not make the same mistakes as others. Um, Christian history, we talked about how they thought it was a fixed earth. And so when science was able to reveal that it wasn't a fixed earth, um, the Christians couldn't go along. They had so got their mind fixed on that being the the scriptural support that they couldn't move on. So we talked about that. All of this is relevant to moving into science of our day, you know. Uh, We must interpret uh, with the literal method and not literalistic method. And if you remember, we talked about uh, using the illustration of a car. Hey, that car's flying down the road at 90 miles an hour. Well, a literalistic interpretation would make everything you just said literal, and that's not what's meant. If someone says that, they're just trying to illustrate a metaphor that's, I saw a car going fast, so it was like he was flying, but that's, you know. So the difference between literal method was, we learned that it means something literally, but it's not taking each word and making it a literal meaning. So we're, we're, you know, usually you can tell if it's a metaphor, you can't make it literal without making it absurd. And so that was the important thing. And then we should reject any private interpretations of scripture. One of the, one of the things that people say a lot in talking to someone else about scripture is, well, what do you think it means? Or what, you know, what's your idea of what's, or what's it mean to you? And right away you're on the wrong track if you go, what does scripture mean to you? Because it may have a meaning to you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. For instance, if you ask an atheist, what does scripture mean to you? Be careful what he's going to say next, because he's going to, you know, he's going to have a very hostile, probably, view of what scripture means to him. Is that what scripture means? No. Scripture has a singular meaning that the author intended it to mean when he wrote it. Someone wrote and they were thinking when they wrote. They were either thinking or God had told them something that they were they were uh, transmitting. So if God said, like in, you go into the prophets like Isaiah, and it, 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 you're going to hear things like, Son of man, say to Israel. So he's actually just writing what God told him and what he told him to say. So he's, it's not that he's thinking uh, as, as much as that he's listening and he's just conveying what the message was. But in all cases, I'm sure he, they are thinking because they understand 
what they're writing. It would be very unusual if someone sat down and wrote something that they didn't even understand what they were doing. So there's got to be thinking involved in it. So um, once again, it's very important for us to focus in on Scripture with the understanding that we are to approach it with humility and understand that it had a meaning. It's not, it's gonna, it's not gonna be what it's saying to us or what it means to us. If we ever say that, hopefully we don't mean it the way it sounds and realize that it's what it meant originally and it still means now. If you can ascertain as closely as possible to what the author meant, that's what it means. Because it's not going to have a, you know, a, a new meaning for today that it didn't have back then. Let's go to chapter 2. We're going to do um, a review of what we learned last week. Historical Christianity has been confounded by true science in the past. Okay, So if we know that our fellow Christians who are just as much sincere believers as we are got confounded by, oh no, Marta, they're telling us that the earth is, is what's moving. And, and I think the Bible says that the earth is fixed because it said it has foundations and it's on pillars. Um, that was a real problem. And as we saw, it's because they were presupposing that the Bible's metaphor was to be taken literal in a literalistic way. And that wasn't exa exactly what God intended in the scripture. So because they, they didn't know what was intended by those scriptures that talk about the earth having pillars, then they were led to believe in this pseudoscience that wasn't true. So through time, the infallible scientific observable proofs, in other words, finally we know because of science and because of our own exploration of our little part of this universe, that the earth actually is moving, orbiting the sun, and that everything else is orbiting the sun, and it's the sun that's fixed, although it's not fixed either because everything's moving and, and, and is in motion. And yet, in all of this, what we learned that our fellow Christians of ages past didn't understand was that the common thing is the Bible is written from a phenomenological point of view. And that is, it is written as it appears. So when you say, the sun rises in the morning, we know technically the sun's not rising, the earth is turning and making the sun look like it's rising. So, it's huh? It sounds like it's turning. Yeah, did you hear that? Scripture often uses metaphors to show what something literally is like. So we learned that a metaphor means it's like this, and they give understanding to how it is in a similar situation or to something else. That was the goal of the uh, metaphor. We learned that Galileo had to recant his observable scientific findings to satisfy the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so what he was able to verify through science, he had to back away from because they couldn't accept it, and it was challenging everything that they believed. Now, they thought he was challenging the uh, truthfulness of Scripture. But in the end, it wasn't the truthfulness of Scripture that was being challenged. It was how that Scripture was being interpreted, just like science was interpreted wrong because people were looking at it from their point of view, and so they thought the earth was steel, and it wasn't the earth that was steel. So... Therefore, science sometimes interprets their science wrong. Sometimes Christians interpret their scriptures wrong. And if we know that going in, then we won't plow ahead and say, I know that the Bible teaches that the earth is 6,000 years old. And that settles it. Does the Bible teach such a thing? If it does, then by faith, we're going to accept the Bible. And we're going to figure out, well, there are some things that could explain that if that were the case and you have young scientists out there young earth scientists they call them and they've got a lot of things that they, they add into it they say science isn't using proper geological findings to estimate the uh the age of the earth for instance there's a guy that takes tours with a christian group all the time throughout the year into the Grand Canyon. And he proves over and over again 
that how science is, is using this data of, of the strata to say that there's billions of years here and they've got a lot of evidence that they show that says no no, no look here's here's proof that it's not it's not working the way they say it works however whether you believe that or not the point is leave your options open since it doesn't affect your faith and most importantly what my goal is is that you don't get your faith shaken by these extremes and, and start feeling like, wow, you know, here's, here's science, here's fossil record, here's, here's a certain amount of things that looks like the earth's very old. So I say, if that is something that's convincing to you, it's kind of convincing to me, to be honest, the, the fossil record and those kind of things are convincing to me that they're, that they're pretty old. And because of that, I want to go back to scripture and I want to say, is there room for that if that's the case and if if it is old what how could we interpret the scriptures uh to see if there's room to let that vision of the age of the universe into the picture because for sure if we get to heaven and it is an old earth and an old universe then god will show that scripture was right on the money as far as how truthful it was and yet there will there will be room in order to explain how it is that he said it this way but it, this is how it was when it was all settled does that make sense um the lesson we learned uh, in linux's first chapter seven days that divide the world was that christians are always capable of having a fixed interpretation of scripture based on bad science and when this happens it can be very difficult to see that the bible is not supporting the false science and may not even support the current interpretation of science nor should christians continue to support bad biblical interpretation just because that particular point of view is held in high esteem by christians maybe for a long time and so it was true to a lot of people so for a long period of time so let's just go with it because it was there a long time a lot of people make their arguments against eschatology about the coming of the lord the rapture of the church these kind of things because for a large bulk of christian history those things weren't taught or 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 uh, theorized very much and because of that there was a very lack of biblical uh, work done on things to come, eschatology. And so the, the, the people that don't want to believe in a rapture, they don't look at the facts of scripture and, and reject it on that basis. They reject it and they just say, well, history, most of the church never believed in a rapture. So therefore, we think this is a new invention, a new revelation that has been superimposed on the Bible and they reject it based on that. That's not good theology. That's not the reason to reject it. The reason to reject it would be if it wasn't scriptural, if the apostles didn't teach it. And uh, boy, you got a problem with that because it's right there in the New Testament as one of the major things that the apostle Paul wrote about in Thessalonians. Um, we must have the humility, there's that word again, to go back to the Bible and take another look and see if our presuppositions were mistakes to begin with. The Bible will always support the truth because its source is the God of truth, and this we can be assured of. And then in chapter 2 of Linux's book, we are reminded that the Bible is literature and that we should understand it just like we would any other book of the same type of literature. The hypothesis in chapter 3 of Linux's book, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, is to ask the question, does the scripture leave room for an old earth as science claims that it is? That's the question. And is there any possible way to read the text in a way that leaves room for the six days of creation to be longer than a normal one week period of time? That's the position of many people when it comes to the, the creation week. And so what Linux is going to say is, now let's think. Think about, does the Bible actually say this? If it does, then that's what we go with. But if it doesn't make it explicitly clear, then that would leave a door open for maybe another way of looking at it, right? Two basic views that divide Christianity is generally between these two. 
the view that creation week is seven consecutive days, 24 hour days, one earth week, and that the universe is around six to 6,000 to 10,000 years old. You might say, why that gap? That gap because we don't know how long Adam and Eve were on the earth before they fell and before they had children. That gap because the Bible, when it gives genealogies, doesn't hit every generation. It will skip over some generations. So we know from biblical genealogies, meaning this person had this person and that was the son of that person and that was the son of that person. We know for sure that the Bible skips some of those. So we know that we can account for about, well, the Jews think we can account for 3,700 years to the time of Christ. <clears throat> So 37 something BC is where some Jews, Jewish scholars start their, uh, their date, age from Genesis. Some are at 4,000 BC approximately, okay? So that's because the Bible's very clear about those years of genealogy, genealogical record. But because there's some skipped generations, then there's an assumption that how many was skipped so that would make it a little you know, longer. We're looking at the two views. The two views are a young earth, 24 hour days for the six day uh, creation week. Secondly, there are those who hold the earth and the universe to be ancient. Both of these views, th this is a key. Both of these views have been around for thousands of years and science, remember science is new, it's very, fairly new. And so there wasn't science a few hundred years ago. So going back the thousands of years of mankind, Science has not been the determinant factor that made it possible to question is there is the earth and the universe old old compared to the the age of man and so uh, as you'll see and a, a, if you were to read his book you would see the details I'm leaving a lot of details out because what I'm trying to do is just expose you to this idea I'm not trying to give you every detail of it if you're interested in it or whoever hears this podcast is interested go get the book seven days to divide the world it's really worth reading but the point is i want to expose you guys to the information on a peripheral level so that you will have heard and understood that there are possibilities beyond one of these views or a a thin slice of this view that are possible even ancient views differ okay philo who was Philo? He was a Jewish scholar who lived at the time of Jesus. Uh, I think he was born in 10 BC. He held that the world was created in a moment and that Genesis was only arranged in order by, uh, by six because it was a logical order. What Linux is trying to point out here is that there are many people who uh, surmised about the possibilities of Genesis before science was an issue. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in other words, there's some open doors of questions that brought, was brought up by ancient guys way, way back who were saying, oh, we're not sure. And so let's, I guess what I think it'd be smart is let, don't pretend that you're sure that the earth is 6,000 years old. If you believe that, it's okay. But just leave the door open a crack that you could be wrong about this. That's, that's the point of learning from the science clash with Christianity in the past, where science was right, Christianity was wrong, and it caused the very horrible uh, friction that didn't need to be. Well, and that way you can save your strong opinions for those things that, that matter. Yes. So people can see the example. And that are provable. Things that, yeah. that are really biblically provable. Uh, early church leaders. Uh, now, when you hear any theologian talk of early church leaders, they call them church fathers. I hate the term church father. Jesus said, don't call any man father. You have one father which is in heaven. That's God. He didn't mean dad but he was talking about using the term father as a as an esteemable position You're like an elder then? yeah 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 so the church fathers comes from the roman catholics making priest fathers and so this is always going back to church fathers so uh anyway they suggested that the days may have been long periods of time on the basis of psalms 90 and 4 which says, for a thousand years in your sight, God, are 
but as yesterday when it is past. And then in 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. My dad used to hold this view. He used to say, well, you know what? Uh, the six days of creation, you don't know if it's 24 hours or if to God, a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. Now, the problem with that is, is that in Genesis, it says, and the morning and the evening was the first day. And so it narrowed it down and made it clear it wasn't talking about a thousand years. However, however, the point is the Bible does have some interesting uh, ways of, of making a day view look different. And where this is leading is, is that maybe this seven days we're talking about can be broken up and there may be some 24 hour days in there and there may not be 24 hours suggested at the beginning or on the end. Okay, and we're gonna, that's the kind of things we're gonna explore because there's some things in the Hebrew that indicate that there's room for some, in other words, someone specifically made some differences that show up when you get into the actual language that leaves room for um, an expansion of an understanding of how this works. One day, to 1,000 years. Irenaeus is uh, Irenaeus. That's, that's another church father. Uh, applied this one day, 1,000 years interpretation of Genesis 2:17, where God told Adam, "In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die." Everyone here knows that Adam did not die in the 24-hour period after he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? right. But we all know he died before he was a thousand years old. This is another thing my dad taught me as a, as a kid, that yes, Adam died a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And that explains that Adam actually did die and no one would ever live beyond that thousand years. This was an early church father view. And uh, once again, the point is there's more than meets the eye when you look at these kind of things that leave open the possibility of a different interpretation. Clement of Alexandria, this is in AD 150. Y'all know Jesus was in the world at uh, 32 AD, I think he was crucified, right? So we're talking about 100 and some years after Jesus. He thought that creation could not take place in time at all since time was born along with things which exist. So his understanding was that the days to communicate the priority of created things, but not the uh, timing of their creation. So in other words, the six days were just a communication deal. It, it had nothing to do with actually uh, when it happened. A lot of these early fathers thought when God spoke, it just the whole thing happened at the minute that he spoke it and willed it into existence. Now, I don't believe that personally. I, I don't believe that. I'm just saying I think what Linux is doing here is he's showing that science isn't the main driver of the questions surrounding this issue. You got that? Right. That's the point. Augustine, probably the most um, known and impactful of the church fathers, so to speak, theologians of the church, um, someone that I don't appreciate a lot because he really came up with a lot of the damaging ideas um, of Bible interpretation. Augustine, we can thank him for this uh, taking the Bible and making analogies out of it, allegorical interpretation. And so he was a brilliant thinker and he was just too, too much of a thinker. He overthought everything. And so he started applying allegorical interpretations like we mentioned about the four rivers in Genesis. And, and so then that was the body, soul, mind, and spirit. And, and, you know, with no scriptural support from any author of the Bible claiming that that's what it is, they come up with this out of their own uh, mental gyrations. Augustine was a highly respected theologian uh, and still is probably the most respected of the Catholic Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but many, many things were way off. Yeah, he, 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 he wrote a book called The City of God and he saw the millennium as being the, the church age when the Catholic Church was in power. 
and he 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 really screwed up a lot of thinking for the church. No, no, I no, I'm not attacking his character, but I'm telling you, he just had too much latitude in his interpretation, and he was in the power to make the, the to make the case. He was a brilliant man, but um, boy, you have to sit around and try to really work hard to undo a lot of his ideas uh, nowadays. So Augustine wrote a lot about Genesis. And he said, as for these creation days, listen to this. This is from a brilliant theologian. He says, it is difficult, perhaps impossible to think, let alone explain in words what they mean. So, you know, he was really emphasizing the, um, you know, the difficulty that exists in this work. He went on to say, at least we know that the Genesis day is different from the ordinary day with which we are familiar. He also taught that God, or thought that God had created everything in a moment, and that the Genesis days represented a logical sequence to explain it to us. I wonder where he got that, probably from Clement of Alexandria. Um, now, these were the prominent theologians of their time. Many who were unsure and grappled with the topic of the age of the earth and creation days were those who were not just armchair theologians or theorists. Some of them were tortured. Some of them were martyred for their faith. They were not influenced by contemporary science, but strained to know and understand the meaning of these things. Nevertheless, this is one of the things that has impacted my life. Um, I was not raised appreciating the history of the church uh, and especially the martyrs and, uh, uh, and the, the great theologians that brought about the Protestant movement. It, it's so amazing how the, the modern day churches sometimes think they can stand without the history of the church and act like they stand alone without it. And yet, all of the progress that was made to get us to where we are today was, was on the backs of these people. Now, these people had some strange ideas, no doubt. They were like us. They were dealing with the world and the understanding of the world that they had in front of them, and they were doing the best they could. And the Holy Spirit was working through them and with them. And in no um, age is the Holy Spirit going to perfect that group of people that exist and make them the preeminent, we know everything there is to know people. That is simply not possible. And so it really is important to look back and, and appreciate our history and connect with them, to be connected with those who were burned at the stake. I mean, our theories uh, of our theology would go so wobbly if we were all tried at the stake of burning. I mean, it would really get down to um, believing some simple things that would either take you through that or you wouldn't make it through that. To treat these issues as simplistic uh, and only a matter of faith is to be blind to the difficulties that naturally arise from the scripture text itself. We have a central commitment. We're committed to the trustworthiness of Scripture. In other words, we, by saying that, I'm saying I'm committed uh, to the fact that I believe this is God's holy word. It is unalterable. It is unrefutable. It is without error in its original languages. It is um, it is uttered by the very breath of God. Okay, I have all of the, those things, confidence in this, uh, in my heart. And I'm assured of the unalterability of the word of God that has been given to us through the inspiration and shepherding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that does not mean that we can take this and know everything there is to know about every subject we are going to have to grapple with some things over time and we are going to die with some things unresolved. And that should make us humble and that should make us a lot more approachable when it comes to discussing these issues. And we, I think the world has a, a good idea and that is a lot of times on the news shows, they'll take someone from extreme views and they'll have them talk. And 
the best conversations are those who have respect for one another. They talk not around each other. They talk to the issues that they disagree upon, but they lay out their arguments and they let people decide for themselves where you're going to come down on what you believe. And that is exactly what we need to do in Christianity. We don't need to cut people off that we don't agree with. We don't need to hide from them. We don't need them to hide from us. We need to be exposed to each other and consistently talk these things through because there are some difficult answers that are not easily found. All the considerations of the interpretation of Scripture is to try and ascertain what the original intent of God's Spirit was in speaking the words that are being spoken, knowing that only this will lead us to the truth of those words. And then we are committed to taking the new and fresh look at the text with a microscope to make sure that we don't make false assumptions that lead us to error. One of the examples that we're going to talk about is the example of death, because one of the things that pushes you to a young earth view is the concept that may, you know, that if Adam and Eve, if death was not possible until Adam and Eve sinned and sin brought death to all of creation and all creatures at the same time, then that kind of stands in stark contrast to what science says, because science has fossils that show the stages of different things coming into being in the world. So we've got uh, different biology, biological plants and different small insects and then animals and so forth coming in at different times in the strata of the earth. And that fossil layer shows that these things came in at a certain time. One comes in later than others. And, and by the way, man comes in at the latest point. Um, so if that's true, then that means those fossils mean those things died. And if things died hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years, billions of years before man even got to the picture, then death did not start with Adam and Eve. It only started on Adam and Eve with human beings. Okay. And so what we're going to do eventually is take a look, uh, probably next week, and take a look at the scripture and say, that, what does it actually say? Linux addresses all these issues. And I was surprised at my own presuppositions about that because before I list or read what he said, I, I was thinking, yeah, that, that's, that's one of my major issues that I have not thought through, obviously, because when he pointed out the answer to this, the Bible text under the microscope situation, it doesn't say what you think that you're assuming that it says. And so it becomes clear that there is room even there for a different look than what you typically have heard. Yeah. Well, just kind of go off what she said. God told Adam, you know, in the day that you eat of the fruit, you will, you will surely die. He probably had to know what death was to understand the concept, right? Uh, Adam? Yeah. Yes. Well, because if death, death had to maybe precede Adam. Hey, that's a good point that you're making a really good point because if you say uh, you're going to die and nothing has ever died, right. then you might be saying, what's that? What's death? Yeah. You know? And so Linux, yeah, Linux explores this very deeply and you're going to, you're going to like all the things we're going to get to on that. Uh, most importantly, we reject the interpretation of Genesis by parable, by legend. In other words, calling in a legend, calling in an allegory. This would be what liberal theology does. They take the book of Genesis and they make it a legend. They say, Adam and Eve weren't real people. This is just a parable story about what it would be if there were really a man and a woman, one man, one woman at the beginning. Of course, most of them don't even believe that happened. They believe that there was a bunch of apes that had evolved from crustaceans all the way up through the animal chain to where they became apes and then they became um, Neanderthals. They're trying a little too hard to combine with science. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And uh, of course, you're never going to hear that from me. I don't think we came from apes. I think that 
uh, that that Genesis is a literal historical book about a literal the literal people that are named in it, and that there was an Adam, there was an Eve. They, they were uh, a special creation of God. Even if everything else is a result of evolution in some form, in some limited way that exists on the face of the earth, Adam and Eve were not that. And we did not evolve into what we are because that would be opposed to what scripture actually says. And so that we're never going to buy into. We embrace the book of Genesis as actual history with historical characters that indeed existed just as portrayed in the pages of scripture. Now I want to show you the three category views from Linux's book here, and it is this. It's the 24-hour view, which are the days or seven 24-hour days of one earth week about 6,000 years ago. That's the probably the most classic, if you were going to have a classic view of what this is about, this would be the classic view. And then uh, there's the day age view, and this is back to the thousand years as a day and a day as a thousand year idea. The days are in chronological order, each representing a period of time of unspecified length. And of course, in that case, they're saying it doesn't even have to be a thousand years. It's just saying these are stages that God did his creation. And so it doesn't matter how long it was these stages existed as logical order of things and the way that they came into being. And by the way, it really holds solidly to what science says that it evolved from. It still follows the same kind of chronological order. And then there's the framework view, which are the days, the days exhibit a logical rather than a chronological order. Um, so let's look at the framework view. We're pretty familiar with the other two views. The framework view is kind of the new one. The framework view distinguishes between two kinds of ordering. Notice the difference when comparing Genesis 1 and Isaiah 45, uh, 12. And look at this, because here you get a good example that if you assume that what someone's telling you is the order they did something, you can see that you could not make that assumption from the Bible based upon just the raw text. Because Genesis 1 says day 1, day 2, day 3 through day 7. But in, Genesis, in Isaiah 45, 12, it says, I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hand, stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. Well, that's a different order, right? In Genesis, he creates the heavens first. Then he creates the earth. And then he creates man and creatures, right? But here he says, I made the earth. Is he telling us what he made first? No. He's just telling us he made the earth. He created man on it. And he also is the one who stretched out the heavens. Now, the significance of this is to make sure, as we learned about Genesis 1, the reason that Moses spends a little bit of time on Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 is because he's making sure you don't think of the God of the Bible as just one of the many gods that exist in the world. That he is the God who created the world. He is the God of all gods. There is only one God. He's making sure you understand that. Isaiah is doing the same thing. God speaks to Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet's probably sitting in a room somewhere, praying, seeking God, and God speaks to him. I made the earth. Who are you talking to? You're talking to the one who made the earth. Ah, not only that, I created man, but I didn't only just create man. I, I put the heavens, the stars into the skies with my own hands. Did God dish out the stars with his hands or is he trying to make a point? Obviously, this is a metaphor. He's trying to make a point. When he did it, he just spoke and it happened. His hands weren't actively doing it, but, but he's speaking in the language of humans because we're made in the image of God. So we can understand what he means by what he's saying. So the order is in a different order, right? Now, the third of the major interpretations in our list, the framework view, prioritizes logical order over chronological order. More than two centuries ago, it was suggested by a guy named Johann Gottfried, 
von Herder, wow, that's a long name, 1744 to 1803, that the Genesis days form a literary or artistic framework, and in this view, days one through three form a triad that corresponds to the triad formed from days four through six. I showed you this on our first lesson, and that is you've got day one, light, day four, luminaries, day two, skies and seas, day five, it's filled with sea creatures and wing creatures. Day three, seas, dry land, vegetation. Day six, land animals and humans. God takes form, fills it. It says in Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and it was empty. Void means empty. Without form and void. Without form and with emptiness, right? So form is given on this triad, filling it on that one. It's, so it, it's saying this is how the Hebrew mind explained the, the essence of how creation was done in the process that it was done to, uh, to have it correspond. A further variation of view three is known as the cosmic temple view. Uh, according to John Walton, the days form a chronological sequence of 24-hour days, but are not given as the period of time over which the material cosmos came into being. But the period of time devoted to the inauguration of the functions of the cosmic temple and perhaps also its annual reenactment. So here again, is this what we're to believe or to, to uh, accept as, as the answer? That's not the point. The point is... Could it be? Or raising the question, could that be the answer? Could that be an answer? Will that be the answer God gives when you get to heaven and you say, how was it actually? We have a lot of, you know, do we all think we're going to get to heaven and everyone's going to agree? No, they're going to agree. When, we get to heaven. when you get to heaven, you'll agree. But before what you agreed upon before you get there will be quite different. Otherwise, not even me and my wife could both go to heaven because we're never going to agree about a lot of things here on the earth. And if we have to agree, then there's going to be a big miracle <laughs> take place before that. Uh, <clears throat> what then should we think of the different interpretations? Well, the first thing we should note that is that they are different interpretations of the same text. So everyone's reading the same book but they have a different interpretation. The much, that much is obvious, but it, ha it has a very important implication, which is that we shall need to think hard about what the text says before trying to decide which interpretation makes the most sense of it. And this is an illustration is very good for us who are interested in truth, because I'll tell you, the best way to, um, to interpret the Bible is to read it thoroughly yourself, and to get your own sense of what you think it means, then test it with what other people say. And then you will be so interested because you've come up with your own interpretation that when you test it with others, then you can see if your interpretation stands or if someone knocks the, you know, the, the feet out from under them. Uh, when you uh, test it with them. Now, this is sometimes easier said than done since all of us bring preconceived ideas to the understanding of any text. You guys ever think about that? What are my preconceived ideas? You know, because this is the hardest thing to not, um, to be aware of. The, of, of. What am I thinking here that causes me not to be able to see this clearly? Because a lot of times that's all it is. We just, we want to see something in a certain way and everything has to fit that perimeter. Yet experience shows us the problems in interpreting a passage often spring from failing to be, see exactly what the text says because we are impatient to get at the meaning. If we believe in the inspiration of scripture, and we do, we must take the text seriously because it is scripture that is inspired, listen to this, and not my particular understanding of it. That's the big difference. This is inspired. When we read it, it's good. But as soon as we put our interpretation on it, you know, that may be the time when we've lost the, <laughs> the inspiration. Now, let's look at a table of contents of Genesis. He's got it sorted here in a, in a table of contents. Um, 
And um, so we're separating it in this slide by three divisions. Genesis 1, the first two verses. Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 1. And then Genesis 2, 2 and 3. And that's the seventh day. Um, so as you can see here, there's, there's a portion of Genesis that's not devoted to the six days. That's the first thing to notice. Um, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void or empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, this is interesting because, first of all, the deist God is a God that believes God sets everything in motion and then he just abandons it to develop on its own. The biblical God is a God who is intimately involved in the full process of not only creation, but the continuation of what's going on today. Creation is still happening. Did you know that? We're still in the creative age. You are an example of that. Because the Bible says, when you were born again, you became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Jesus said you couldn't have become that creature except you were born from above. So just like your mom and dad had to get together intimately for you to be here, unless you were in the age of in vitro uh, fertilization. The point is... The creative, the creative thing that's going on, not only is going on still with humans and animals and different things, but God is actually still creating a people he calls the church. It's not done yet, so it's still in the creation phase. And it's creation because um, it's not going to happen without an active process. Born from above. You've got to be born from above. That means God has to be involved. Born from, from heaven, born from above, is, is, is to say that someone has to do something, and that someone would be God. So since, since the church is not complete, and it's still being added to, the creative processes are still moving forward. And since God's promises in the Bible as to what kind of earth and what kind of kingdom and what kind of environment there's going to be eventually in the world, that process hasn't come to pass yet. So he has got to actively make that happen. And guess what? Look at what's going on in your world today and you're seeing your small part of that creative process happening right now. In other words, just like tomorrow, you're going to get up if you work you're going to get up with an agenda. You're going to know you have to be up at a certain time. You got to do this and that and that. You got to get in the car. You got to go to work. You got to do this at work. You have all this. You think God is sitting in heaven doing nothing, twiddling his thumbs? He's not. He's actively participating in his creation. So this, this scripture here that says, and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it, it likens it to an eagle that flutters over her nest to protect and to uh, take care of her chicks in the, in the nest. So the, the eagle flutters like helicopters right over the top to protect it. So Genesis 1 and 2, look at that. The statement of creation is separate from the six days. So what's the major impressions we get from reading those, those verses? Number one, a chronological sequence of events with no accounting for the time. Right? Genesis 1 and 2 does not account for time. The, the, the whole creation is said to have been done, and there's no day one, morning, evening. Nothing like that is, is mentioned there. Number two, it is noticeable that the thing starts without form and void or empty. So this is God doing what he wants to do, but he doesn't complete it in the first act. He doesn't just go, bam, it's perfect from the beginning. No, it was perfect for his next stage. And then the next stage was perfect because it goes on 
in the days saying, and God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. In other words, everything's right on, right on target. And time is involved here. Um, number three, the narrative describes how God speaks through his creative word day by day, step by step, shaping, filling the empty and formless earth with form, shape, and life. Okay? And then we can't help but notice the stages aiming for a goal. It, as it progresses, making this habitation fit for creatures that uniquely bear God's image and likeness. Human beings is the goal because he gets the humans created and his creation comes to a stop for the order of creation, right? So the crowning creation is humans and then he gives the humans dominion over all of creation. One of you read Isaiah 45, 18 on the screen there for me. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no, none else. Okay, listen to the words there. He did not create the earth to be empty. He, he created it to be inhabited. So, let's conceptualize if science is right and the, Earth's the, earth, the earth and the universe around the earth is billions of years old or something like that, it would indicate that God is patient letting things shape and form and then interacting at key points bringing order and forming the events as they take place and if you think about it this is exactly what happens in our life isn't it interesting you know we all live probably a similar number of days but all of our days are not the same and our times and our days they are bringing us to somewhere if especially if we are uh, born of God then there is a purpose behind our days and guess what as a as a believer you will find that there are days that you will get off course and God will bring you back on course that you will um, think you're gonna you know determine that you're gonna do one thing and God won't allow you to do that and he'll make you do something else in my life, I thought I'm going to go live in this town, and I couldn't get there. I thought I'm, huh? Yeah. I thought, you know, the, the various times I've done everything I could to make something happen, and I couldn't make it happen. And then at other times, everything I wanted to happen, I didn't know how to make happen. He made it happen without effort. And so, you know, it's incredible how he is actively involved in our life. So... Here we note that God created the world first in a stage of formless emptiness, but this wasn't the whole. It was only a part, a stage in the process. And if we observe that stage and we understand that it was a stage, then we might expect if we find stage one, then we're going to find another stage two and so on and so forth. Now, let's talk about the meaning of the word day for a minute as we come to a close. We're going to close out here in about three or four minutes. Um, the meaning of the word day in Genesis 1, the Hebrew word for day is yom. <clears throat> it's first mentioned in Genesis 1.5. It says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. What is the natural reading of this statement? Here, day is contrasted with night. So, we're not talking about a 24-hour day. We're talking about a 12-hour day, right? Yeah. John 11.9, Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in a day? So Jesus was talking there about Yom, and he was talking about a day in terms of it being only 12 hours long. So the point is, in Hebrew, sometimes a day means 24 hours. Sometimes a day means 12 hours. As a matter of fact, there are times that you'll refer to a day, like you'll say, hey, back in my day. Well, you don't mean a day you're really taking your whole life when you were young and putting it into the terms that it's one day 
So the point that Linux is making and bringing this stuff out is how all of us are familiar with how the term day can mean different things. What's the point? The point is, can we strictly say that it has to mean what we think it means? Or is there an opening for it to mean of, uh, it's, it's ultimately going to mean one thing when it comes to the six days of creation, but are we sure we know what that is? That's the question, right? Um, the second time the word for day occurs in Genesis is, is also in 1.5, and it is in the context of saying that the day one involves an evening and a morning, and day would naturally there be understood to be a 24-hour day. So now we have a primary meaning of day is 12 hours, and another primary meaning for day is 24 hours, all in the same arena, so to speak. The next occurrence of the word day that we need to pay attention to is the account of the seventh day. This is the key. This is a key. The Sabbath on which God rests from the work of creating. There, listen, is no mention, and I never realized this until I read this book. There's no mention on the seventh day of an evening and a morning as there was for each of the other six days. The omission is striking and it needs explanation because this is not an accident. Every word of the Bible is purposeful. So we know there's no omission by accident here. If, for instance, we ask how long God rested from his work on creation as distinct from his work of upholding the universe, then Augustine's suggestion that God sanctified the seventh day by making it an epic that extends toward onward into eternity makes good sense. So in other words, he's saying that Augustine thinks the reason there's no evening and morning mentioned on day seven is because it is never ended. That it will be God's day of rest started and it will extend on forever now because it's the perfect day. And we also know that the millennial kingdom is a thousand years as a day is a thousand years to the Lord. He's got a thousand year kingdom where he's going to restore the earth, take away the curse, take Satan out of the earth. In other words, the earth will be better than it's ever been before because not only will the curse be removed and death be put at bay, but also the devil, which always has been here, will not be here at that time. That's why I've always rejected the idea that what we're trying to do is get back to the Garden of Eden. I don't think so. The Garden of Eden had one horrible thing wrong with it. Satan. And that is not going to be in the millennial kingdom. So the millennial kingdom is better than the garden of Eden because no devil will be there. No serpent to tempt. No one to push you over the edge and cause you to do things against God. Will people do things against God? Yes. God will prove once again that man is the problem. Not even the devil is the made me do it, you know, is the problem. All of this is very important. So Augustine saw that in that sense and so once again, Linux is trying to say, well, okay, then if we're going to talk about that the six days of creation was a week of days of 24-hour days, but, but we could agree that the seventh day was not a 24-hour day, then maybe we should go back and see if that's exactly what is meant by the text. And, you know, since we're out of time, I'm not going to be able to take you to the very, very good part. The great part is... Uh, Linux takes us through a process that shows us the uniqueness of the Hebrew language and how there's some indicators even there that every day was not to be looked at exactly the same. And so ultimately, the hypothesis that this is going to is that there is no time involved in the beginning, verses 1 and 2. So it leaves wide open the idea that you can uh, have an old earth, if that indeed is the case. And then you get to the days, and he's going to present the case that each day could have been exactly 24 hours where God issued the command and set in motion a creative act. And then there could have been time. And then there could have been another day. And then there could have been another act and time. And, and what he says is, this is what science appears to indicate, that science has these crustaceans, I forget what they're called, but that, that, that 
you know, there was, there was nothing evolving, nothing changing for zillions of years. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, bam, there's a, there's a word for this and it's driving me crazy that I can't think of it. Uh, but it's something crustacean, but something, something major came on the scene unexpectedly in the fossil record that showed you know, not an evolution, but a new species and a new level of category of, of creature. And then there was a long time, long, 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 long time. And then there was another boom. Uh, there was no evolving, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, till you get another animal, but you actually have them just suddenly appearing. And so he says, that because he's a scientist and he's looked at what science has said about this and he believes they're onto something about this biology that it looks like that what happens is is that that things are going along god's you know doing not not interjecting and then bam he speaks for a new stage and that new stage just immediately do it comes into being and then it goes on and on for time and then Bam, God makes another major change. And oh, all of a sudden they're in the fossil record. There's a new level of stuff. And then for, for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, then boom, there's another one. So he's presenting that, yes, you can take all these three different ideas of creation and actually find that all of them have some level of truth in it to, to create this hypothesis. And that is, is that you have day one, and then you have a gap, and then you have day two, and then you have a gap. Then you have day three, and you have a gap all the way to day six. And that late in creation, God makes man and brings him into being. You've been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. You can find more podcasts and contact info at our website at www.fathomministries.org Thank you for listening. I ain't living without you Dead wrong to ever doubt you But my demons lay in wait and tempted me Without an overdose of you